So we're going to talk about core data, magic record, and Swifty stuff today. Uh, reminder before we get going uh, to go ahead and download the app, review the, the session and all that stuff. So um, I was going to say, uh, also, if you're not familiar with me, I'm Saul Mora. Uh, you might know me from a podcast called NS Brief. It's pretty cool. The kids like it. Talk about cool developer -y stuff with developer friends from around the world. So got, got lots of European people on there. So you might, you might like to hear what they have to say. Uh, I also work at a place called Lounge Buddy out in the small startup in San Francisco. Uh, so just so you know, you can uh, download that app if you travel a lot and uh, go do some stuff with that. So um, what we're going to talk about today, uh, data. Uh, data is uh, the heart of your app, or if you will, the core. Uh, data is, is this silent workhorse. You, you have these, these, these nice apps, and there's all this stuff going on behind the scenes. Uh, and this is, a, this is a real live shot of, of an app in work. Uh, but we've got, uh, you know, we've got these mobile devices. They're really handy, they're really personal, and they're really flashy. And the users kind of don't realize that uh, the data is, is super important. So they don't realize that data is what uh, makes their app super useful and super functional and it's the reason why people come back and use their apps right so how do we tie uh, the data to the UI right so we've got a framework called core data which is uh, hopefully you're, you're aware of that uh, and the thing is is we've got these these apps and these like I said these things are nothing without data so you've got a nice app it's got all this information on here and I'm just kind of I didn't go through the exercise of scraping the, the 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 numbers off of here but if there was no data here what would this app be it would be pretty useless. It'd be just a bunch of pixels all over the place. There's no information. The information is really what you're, use, what you're looking for. The fact that you have the pixels and the presentation and all the graphics in the UI help you consume the data. But if without the data, your app is nothing. So again, we've got the, this framework that we need to actually get our data into the app and into the user's uh, 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 interface here. So core data. You li li like my, my pictures there? You can get that one. It's a pretty easy reference, right? I thought the, uh, the nerd crowd would get that. Uh, so some of you might be familiar with the, something called an ORM, uh, Object Relational Mapper. Um, I was kind of thinking that this would be more of an enterprise-focused crowd, and that's definitely one of the technologies that I know uh, enterprises use a lot. Uh, things like, I think, Hibernate. Uh, I think back in the day when I did .NET, it was nHibernate was the big deal. Um, stuff like that. Uh, the problem with uh, ORMs is they are generally leaky abstractions. Uh, so uh, things like uh, having SQL queries embedded in your um, actual app code is generally the one big problem that, that we have with ORMs. Um, just the fact that you kind of have this idea that your, your client code knows about all how the database works and is structured and everything is, is kind of bad because then you can do secret things in this one place, but then this other place doesn't know that secret trick. So then you try to access the same data and it doesn't do it the right way. So uh, you, you can kind of run into some problems by, by having those abstractions be leaky. Now, core data is, is a little bit different. Uh, it's actually an object uh, graph persistence framework. So you're actually dealing with a uh, graph of objects and they just happen to save to disk or some uh, persistence mechanism. Now, uh, our previous session had mentioned an in-memory format. Now, that's certainly one place that it could go. You could also write your own custom format, uh, or you could use something like a JSON or a plist. You could actually write an atomic store that stores all of your data to a plist. If you need to debug, uh, debug in quotes there, uh, some of your data, uh, you can do it to uh, an, XML for, for, uh, an XML file. Uh, I wouldn't use that in your regular app, so it's really slow. Um, but anyhow, let's just go over core data and some of the uh, objects that we have uh, real quick. Uh, first of all, let's start off with our NS Persistent Store. Like I was just saying, you could have any type of format that you need. Uh, JSON. Uh, if you wanted to do JSON, you'd have to write this yourself. Uh, but, you could, but you have that flexibility to do that. And a Persistent Store is an object in your stack. Think of it as the bottom of your stack. This is where all the data goes uh, once you actually save it to disk. 
Uh, so next up is our uh, Persistent Store Coordinator. So the coordinator helps manage traffic between some of the upper layers we'll talk about in a second and the Persistent Store. So this just kind of says, here's an object. Uh, where does it need to save? And it saves it in the proper store. And it, and it kind of does a lot of that work for you. So it's kind of a, a traffic cop for your data uh, between the upper and lower levels. The next thing that we've got in our core data tour here is the NS Manage Object Model. Uh, if you're familiar with databases, you can think of this as your schema. Uh, this describes what your data looks like, uh, how, uh, you know, what entities there are, what properties they have, how, what, how each entity is related to each other, uh, whether an entity has a super entity or not. Uh, this, uh, this Manage Object Model also has things like uh, fetch requests that you can have pre-canned. Uh, you can have some different configurations. But this basically gives you a, a nice overview of what your data looks like. And it's really nice uh, because what we also have is a tool that is basically a visual modeler. Uh, what, what's nice about it is that you can actually see all of the objects in your application and actually visualize the relationships and the hierarchy. So what I like to do is have all of my kind of my, my domain objects into this in this uh, visual editor uh, just to get, get basically have a map of what, what I'm uh, trying to, to work with. Uh, so next on the, the list here is the NS Manage Object Context. So uh, the best analogy for this is basically a scratch pad. So uh, what you'll be doing late, most often with core data is you'll be using uh, the NS Manage Object Context uh, with tons of NS Manage objects, right? So uh, an object is going to, uh, I guess, be related to a context in, in a way that uh, one instance kind of relates to one, uh, one instance of an object relates to one instance of a context, right? So if you have multiple contexts and you have multiple objects, those objects are not going to belong to two different contexts, right? So a context is a place where you can say, uh, I need to save this thing of this, I need to write this piece of data, and it's only going to write it in that context. If you have another context, which we'll talk about shortly, and you have the same piece of data, it's not going to be the same actual row, right? So this is where this, this whole flow of traffic gets down, gets a little complicated, and that's why you have something like a coordinator to manage who writes to the actual store and who wins and how to merge these things. There's a lot of moving pieces in, in a core data stack. All right, so and we've got these relationships here. So uh, this is a really high-level overview, not very not in-depth. I'm hoping uh, most of you already know a lot of the things about core data and about these objects. But uh, what I wanted to get to was maybe some of the code. Uh, this is a very simple, simple way to create a person object uh, for use in your code. This is kind of the raw raw way to do it. So what you do is you get the entity description. So the NS entity description is an object that is uh, stored in your manage object model that describes what that object looks like in the model, right? So this is saying, I have, an, I have a class, the entity description, so create me an instance of a person in this case. That's a lot of code to just say person alloc init or person new, right? That's a lot of code for that. Seems kind of nutty. Here's how we would find, what are we finding in here? I forgot. I think we're finding employees. Yeah, it's, it's, it, got, it got moved a little bit. But uh, yeah, we're finding employees in this example. All we're doing is we're searching for employees. We are setting a uh, sort order. And we're actually doing a little bit of a filter, just as a, an example for a predicate. And then we're also sorting things. And then we have a fetch request, and we send it off. And then in case we have errors, we also have to handle the errors every time. That's a lot of code. It's a lot of uh, very error-prone, messy code. All right? So, And if we wanted to save stuff, well, we have to use uh, perform block now. So uh, in kind of the, the pre, I think, iOS 7 days, before iOS 7, you didn't have to use perform block. You could get away with it uh, without using it, um, especially since it's a newer API. Uh, but nowadays, you have to use perform block or perform block and wait. And if you're going to do anything with, with any uh, object data, you want to do that here. And to save data, you're going to take your data, uh, and you're going to have another context. And you're going to do it on, on this MOC uh, mock object here. And you have to make sure that you load 
the object that you want to save into that context that you're performing the block into, modify the changes inside that block, and then do your perform saves inside the perform block call. This is very complicated. I'm not even saying this correctly to make you understand. I know this. This is here to kind of show you just how, I guess, difficult some of these core data APIs are because it's not really intuitive as to when you need to use what. Right? Just the fact that I said this perform block is something that you need to use all the time just kind of adds to the confusion, I think, because I don't see a whole lot of people using that. So this is the Entity Modeler. Uh, this is really nice. The other, th the other thing about this thing is, is that um, when you create a new entity in your uh, uh, model here, right? so when you do this, you'll go up to File, and I think you'll say uh, one of the menus, and say uh, Create new uh, entity for, from the model, right? So you'll pick the entity that it relates to. So say, I wanted to create the new GitHub event uh, class code so that I could tie that code to this entity. And then it'll uh, Xcode will generate you a class file. Well, when you change uh, this entity here, like adding a new attribute or change the type or change the relationships or anything like that, you have to manually go and update that code that you just edited in Xcode or created in Xcode. And if you go and update it through Xcode, it will go and delete all of your previous changes. So that was kind of not cool. <laughs> so all of these things, for as cool as Core Data is, it's like, why? What, what a big pain in the butt. So uh, one of the solutions to one of the problems is called uh, Mo Generator. So that last problem that I talked about, where we have something that uh, you have the code tied to the way that your entity is described in that manage object model, uh, those things together, um, that uh, is solved using this tool called Mo Generator, and it uses something called the generation gap pattern. Uh, and the generation gap pattern is really really simple. Uh, you basically have a base class, a very common base class, and you have uh, a subclass that's generated off of that base class. So in our case with NS manage objects, right? So the manage NS manage object will be our base class. And Mo generator will automatically generate and regenerate based on the schema, the and the manage object model. It'll regenerate all of the properties, all the attributes, all the things that you need and able to be able to uh, interact with core data uh, on a code basis much easier. So it'll generate that all of that uh, boilerplate code for you, and it'll update it every time. And then what you do in that in that case is then use the, your own hand-coded subclass off of the generated class. So this is that generation gap. So the between, instead of having uh, NS manage object and then directly subclassing that, you have uh, the generated code in the middle. And that, that gets you uh, by a lot of stuff. And that's a super handy tool. I use it all the time. Um, Definitely open source. You can go get that on GitHub. And the way that I use it is I actually have it in of, as part of my Xcode build step. So I've got a little script there. And when you get the, uh, the notes from this talk, uh, there'll be a link to the script that I have. And I basically what I do is I have this regenerate core data entities code. And that will go and rebuild and regenerate all of those generated files. And I'll make sure I do that before the compile sources step in my project. And that way, every time I do Command-V or you know Command-R to run, uh, I've got my entities all up to date based on what's configured in my core data model automatically. There is there is no more thinking of that. It's just I change it, and it's done. Uh, automatic stuff like that is super handy. So you can grab this uh, script. Um, I update this uh, often enough. Uh, when I figure out how to do more scripty, shelly stuff. But uh, it's very useful, and I, I recommend uh, this as part of your build step when you're using core data. That gets rid of a little bit more pain. The other thing to get rid of pain uh, is magical record. Uh, this certainly uh, has helped me over the years. And new in 3.0, we have some more fun stuff. So um, one of the fun things in magical record is uh, now we have things called stacks. So we have a whole uh, object to kind of collect all of those different objects, right? So one of the things with core data, which is kind of weird, is that you have four different objects that you have to use in order to just access a file, right? So when it comes down to it, uh, you're just trying to get data 
and push it down into a file on disk. So this is really like a file interface format, right? And you have all of these different objects to kind of do all these different things. And it's overly complicated. So what I've done is kind of created this idea of a stack that basically holds on to all of those objects into one object that you can use uh, with an easier interface so that you just do the things that you need to do and the stack will kind of figure out all of the details in between to do them to do them in the manner that is most efficient based on the type of stack that you've chosen right and so in this case this is a very simple stack a SQLite magical record stack all it does is it has one persistent store one coordinator one model one context done it's very, very simple, one of each, and all you get is a context, you save data to the stack, and it'll figure it out. And to turn it on, you just say, hey, I need a new SQLite stack. If you want to tell it a particular store file name because you don't like the default one, just give it a parameter. It's, it's a very simple thing. Like, you already know what you want to do. You don't need to go through the, the exercise of redoing all of that core data code, especially the sample code that Apple gives you in their templates. Horrible. Don't use it, please. So we looked at this example a little bit earlier with uh, fetching. If we look at some of the stuff that was um, what we were actually looking for, uh, we can actually boil it down to something like this with Magical Record. So all we need to do is, um, let me see, this was kind of going a little bit slow. Maybe I'll go back here. All right, here we go. So what I wanted to point out here was like out of all of this code, the only things that were actually like really important were like the class name, and the predicate and how we're sorting, right? All of that other stuff should just be automatic or refactored into some kind of helper method. And that's what we're actually trying to do with Magical Record. So we're actually just trying to say, have a simple way to get the data, have a function or a method that will do that, and just a really nice way to kind of read the code and just see that you're actually just fetching data without having to worry about all of the details, the error handling, any logging, uh, how to format the fetch request. You really don't care. All you want is the data. And this lets you access the data with a really simple API. So if we wanted to save data, this one, this one I think is like the, the really awesome part of Magical Record. If we want to save data, we had to do a whole lot of stuff. We had to create another managed object context. Uh, if we wanted to have multiple contexts, which is very common, we have to figure out how to merge that, have to set it, how to set it up, especially in the old days before uh, our nested context scenario with core data. We had to use uh, NS Notification Center to listen for the notification and observe and merge and do all this, all of this stuff that you just didn't want to deal with. And all I wanted was, I just want to save data. It's like as, as simple as that. And if I have to save data, I have to do it through a context on occasion. So I made this API that says, hey, save with block. And here's the context that you write all your data to. Basically says, here's where you're going to save your changes to. I will create it for you. I will save it for you. And I will also do all the merging. I will handle all the errors. Everything is already handled. It's just a really simple API that you can focus on your data, right? And what's nice is you can also have a completion handler. So when you know that, so when Magical Record knows that the com that the save has finally completed, that step is done. Everything's persisted on disk. Uh, then you'll get a completion block, and you can kind of do some stuff there. Uh, I have seen this API misused, however, which I guess any API can be misused, but uh, it's definitely. Uh, has had some good intentions here, and it's been very useful. So um, there's a lot of good uh, ways that you can use this API. So the thing about uh, core data, and like like I said, it's just this. All it, it boils down to core data being a simple API or an API that lets you save changes to a file on disk. So why do we need all of these objects and all this configuration, all this complication, when something like maybe uh, NS Coder could do or uh, a plist format would do, right? Well, the thing is, is like this handles a lot of uh, it handles objects directly, and uh, you don't have to. You have various uh, performance uh, characteristics and various flexibilities with your architecture. They solve different problems uh, for different uh, things in your in your app. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, can I think of this whole stack as a serialization um, framework? Yeah, it's it's a well being an object graph persistence framework. I mean, it's it's about serializing, and the serialization happens in the NS Manage object itself. So, so yeah, so yeah, it's definitely a serialization framework. Um, 
and NS coder, plist, they're all different types of serializations within uh, the Cocoa framework itself. So the, I guess the point is, as I'm trying to say, is like we have these four objects. Why do we need four objects? Or why do we need these four classes, right? So in certain cases, you're going to actually need a second manage object context, especially now because core data is going to actually try to manage the threading for you. So what what will typically be the case is you'll have like one of these contexts be the on the main thread, and the other one be on the private uh, private queue, or basically a background context. So a lot of times you'll do your changes and you'll save them on the background queue and get some updates on the main queue thread, right? So you'll have two different ones, and if you have them in isolation, you could say save this one and then notify the other one and merge those changes separately. So this second context mode is very common. This is, this is kind of the preferred way to use uh, core data in general. Um, but there's also the case uh, well, you'll need uh, maybe multiple stores. And why would you need multiple stores? Well, think of having uh, different Word documents, or not Word, pages documents <laughs> open, right? So you have different files, different instances of files on disk, and you have them all connected to the same coordinator. Now, in your application, it doesn't really care which file is every object belongs to. That's the job of the coordinator. The coordinator knows, hey, here's an object, and I, it's going to be saved. Well, pick you know, persistent store B. Or here's another object, you know, pick the other persistent store C. It knows how to do that. That's what, that's what that coordinator does. It's the traffic cop. So it knows that, that it knows which file the object should go into, the data should go into. But from your app's perspective, it doesn't really care. It just says, hey, I have some data. It came from somewhere. Core data can deal with that, and you don't have to deal with any of that. So it's kind of nice. So another another scenario is that if you really need to save like a whole bunch of data really really fast, there are scenarios where you have high throughput. You basically say I'm importing a bunch of data and I'm going to do it at you know the store level. I'm going to do the file locking at the lowest level possible, which basically is on disk or at the operating system level, right? So in a lot of cases, you're going to actually share this persistent store and you're going to have two parallel stacks all the way up. Uh, right, so uh, this is a this is a case where you're importing tons and tons of data, and this may be more common on a Mac, um, but certainly you could do this on iPhone as well. Um, but you're going to import a lot of data, and you want it to be as fast as possible. So that means if you're doing it in a multi-processing or multi-threading environment, you want to have as few locks as possible, right? Because locks slow you down. So to have as few locks as possible, you have in a completely uh, separate uh, persistent store uh, coordinator. And they're going to share the same model, so because the data is going to look exactly the same. So again, uh, this is some examples of how to do that in uh, Magical Record. Uh, so we can set up a SQLite stack by the defaults, really easy. Uh, if we need an in-memory store, this is how you would do it in Magical Record. Super awesome, super easy, because it's pretty readable. Like I don't know about you, but like some of the uh, options in, in Core Data. So I nef never remember all those stupid enumerations and, and configuration values. So uh, this, this is usually a lot easier for me. I just changed the slide, if you didn't notice. Because uh, <laughs> it, it's so subtle, right? All you change is auto-migrating stack. Uh, you know, and if you need to do a manual one, it does it there. Uh, and if you need to set the store name, or you can set the path, the URL. Uh, you know, when you're trying to save data to a file, all you care about is maybe where that file is located and what it's named. and there may be some performance details that you care about at one point, but after that you don't care, right? You only care that you have something to save to. So uh, it kind of takes care of that for you. Again, it's on it's on GitHub, so out there, open source for free, uh, for all you guys to to grab. Uh, it's pretty popular with the kids these days. So yeah, but anyhow, uh, we wanted to talk about Swift and kind of maybe going forward a little bit. So. The thing about magical record, uh, and maybe you've noticed this, is like I, you know we talk we wanted to talk about Swift, but up until now all of the code has been in Objective C. So Objective C has definitely influenced the design of the magical record code base and just the way that magical record works. Uh, it's very dynamic. Core data itself is a very dynamic framework. It's very key value coding oriented. Uh, if you notice on when you're saving data. Uh, when you want to set data, you set it uh, using key value coding type of methods. You say object set value for a key, 
right? So you have that, that same, same mechanism, and it keeps it very dynamic. Um, but with Swift, it's not like that. Swift likes to be pre-compiled. It likes to know about all of these properties ahead of time, right? So how do we reconcile that, right? And the, the core data engineers reconcile that by putting a nice NS managed, ob uh, at NS managed keyword in the language in Swift so that it could tell the compiler, like, this still needs to be dynamic and it's core data specific. And there's all these things that it does for you under the covers that we don't even know. But all we have to do is we have to tell the language that this is a special property and it has special, special things that go on under the covers that we don't need to worry about. But that just kind of shows you that core data is, is a different beast when it comes to how it works with Swift and Objective-C as well. So uh, Magic Record also took advantage of Objective-C uh, just to just as the way it works. Um, so a couple of things to note, like in this example here, uh, one of the things that we had to do uh, early on uh, was add this mr underscore prefix to everything. Right, so that prefix is a result of Objective C and categories, and what happens when uh, categories get redefined and reloaded later on in the system, right? So if you have two categories named the exact same thing, which one gets loaded? Undefined. Typically, you might guess it's the last one to be loaded, which is what my logical guess would be, but that's still undefined. That's it could be that, it could be that it just picks a random number and then picks wh whichever one it likes. It doesn't matter. We don't know. Uh, so we had to use something like this that basically said, this is our namespace. These methods that have this prefix are ours guaranteed. If anybody overwrites them, well, you know, they really messed up. So that's a consequence of uh, you know, obje of the Objective-C language. The other thing that we could do here uh, was put stuff as class methods here. Now we could still do that in uh, in Swift, but I think in Objective-C it's a little easier to read this way with a class method. Maybe it's a little a little more complicated. Uh, and the other thing is uh, these name parameters definitely influence the way that the f the, c the uh, API kind of was designed and the way that we try to label things and flow and kind of more classic um, you know, uh, API design elements. But if we were to convert it to Swift, some things would read really, really weird. So if we have that MR underscore, that doesn't really fit with the Swift language. So you know, we don't want that to carry over. The other thing is that the Magical Record code base is pretty large. It is quite large. I was surprised at how large this code base is. Um, I've, I've always said that Magical Record is a framework and a collection of core data related methods and helper methods that you could write on your own. I've just collected them all for you and put them in one bundle. And uh, I just didn't know how large that framework was until I went and looked. Um, I guess what's also in there is a nice uh, import uh, library that we'll go over really soon here. Um, there's also a bunch of logging and stuff. Uh, there's a bunch of just helper methods. The stacks thing is really useful. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there just to make your life easier and, and uh, make my life easier too. So, w you know, when it comes to deciding how to move forward, I have to take into account that not only is this code base kind of large now, it's pretty stable for the most part. Uh, any crashes are just a result of user error for the most part. So I really don't want to rock the boat and rewrite everything uh, just because everything's in Swift, right? So I've got to take this into account. The other thing that I noticed is that Swift moves pretty fast. Did you see it there? It was, it was pretty fast. Did you miss it? Swift is pretty fast. So on the timeline here, uh, let's, t let's look at, uh, take a look at some history here. Uh, Swift was first announced, oh, just last year. And uh, let's kind of walk through that timeline here. So 1.0 was about uh, uh, October 2nd. Uh, that introduced uh, failable initializers. Oh my gosh. Can you believe that wasn't at launch? 1.1 or 1.2 was on February 9th, 2015. That introduced the as bang. Uh, it introduced uh, compound if let statements. So the if let, comma, if let, comma, or comma if let, comma let, whatever. Uh, it also introduced, what else did it have here? 
It introduced uh, Objective C improvements so that you could mark them as null or non-null, so that they would actually convert over into Swift properly. Right. So that was only February. This is an almost three, four months cadence, and then we got a big drop in June, and you know how that was. Right, with the guard statements and the protocol extensions and all those fun things. I mean, in one year, like I, you know, I was still trying to learn Swift as a functional language, and in one year, it just changed a whole bunch of stuff on me. So, the hard thing about converting something that kind of works, and a lot of people's apps rely on this code base. Like Magical Record is something that isn't a lot of App Store code, and uh, to kind of change that and uh, this fast is really hard. <laughs> so I really don't want to, you know, basically I don't want to make less work for myself and not have everybody come yell at me like, hey, you changed this API, what'd you do? You know, I'm, I'm trying to not uh, not do all that kind of work, but still, you know, keep things moving forward. Oh, and I forgot, we've also had betas in between that broke a lot of stuff. So <laughs> like, you know, you're never going to win because this thing is just going so, so fast. So you have to be kind of, you have, it, sometimes it is better to wait when it comes to some of the Apple uh, APIs. And core data is one of those things that it doesn't feel like Apple's going to really rock the boat on API-wise. It feels like core data is going to be pretty much on its same trajectory for a long time to come. So I really don't feel like I need to go at this pace, or Magic Record needs to go at this pace to kind of keep up with stuff. But it doesn't mean that it's not, not good to kind of keep going. One of the other things with Swift was that it's less dynamic. And this was kind of actually one of my, one of the kind of things I had a hard time dealing with uh, in the beginning with Swift. It's like, how do I not use this language that isn't dynamic? Because dynamic languages are really cool. I mean, once I figured out how to hack the Objective-C runtime and you know, you know, intercept messages and use proxy objects and you know, just all that fun stuff, you know, con you know, writing to selector, you know, writing my own selectors and and doing that kind of stuff. It was it was hard to give that up. <laughs> so, and let's let's see how it's actually used in Magical Record to be really really useful. For one, this is the secret sauce in Magical Record. This is how it figures out what entity to look up and how to map that entity description to the entity class. It's really simple. Now, what it also does is it gives you an opportunity to override that entity name yourself. And this is how it works with MoGenerator. So Magical Record has worked with a MoGenerator from the beginning because of this secret sauce. Because MoGenerator already implements this method. So I'm just using what MoGenerator already does. And if I need to change it, I can just change it in a subclass in my own custom entity, and it works. I define the mapping where it's supposed to be in the object and the class and the code that it's related to. But this is the secret sauce. This is dynamic. It's very useful. This is very hard. It's, it's, I, I could probably do this in a in a protocol, so maybe that's not the best uh, best example. So let's move on to the next one. This is nice. So remember that data importing I talked about. So should, will, and did import are methods that are called back on the calling classes uh, when we do data imports. All right. So a should import obviously gives you an opportunity to bail out of importing data that might be bad. Right. And then before and after just tells you, hey. Here's some data. It was done, right? Now this is also implemented in a protocol, so maybe this isn't this isn't really that good of an example either. So let's talk about this one. What does this one do? So this one's a little more ugly, only because I have to do things in the kind of approved Objective C way. So remember, before we could just do uh, object perform selector with object and just use those kinds of methods. Uh, a long time ago, maybe around Xcode 4-ish, I don't remember, it was a couple of years ago, uh, Apple had said, don't use the perform selector methods. Use NS invocation instead. Because what NS invocation does is it checks all of your arguments, checks all of your selectors, and things like that. It does some more checking for you, which is what they want to do to help you. So hence, we have the bottom, I don't know, the bottom third of this is really kind of boilerplate stuff just to be able to send off that method. But the top three lines are really, or the top two lines there are really important in this method. So we have in the red, it says import some string with a colon. So it's creating a selector 
how are we creating the selector from? Well, we're creating the selector from the key. All right, so what we're actually doing in this method, we are importing a value for a particular key. So for one attribute on an entity, right, we're going to say here's some data imported into that attribute on an entity. And so what happens is we're going to create a selector that says import capital attribute name. And we're going to create this selector dynamically. I cannot define this in a protocol. This is a convention-based interface, right? It's a convention-based API. So it lets me write client code like this that lets me define custom import logic on a property-by-property -property basis or an attribute-by-attribute -attribute basis in my entities. And I have this all over the place, and it's useful. And it doesn't, it means that I don't have to clutter up code all over the place. It says, well, here's all of my custom import logic. It's this giant, messy function. It's just, well, here's my, the majority of my import routine, and this one special property needs it. Now, if I don't implement, in this case, import name, it's not going to be called, right? It had an if response to selector check beforehand. But this is the power of dynamic programming, and this is where it's kind of hard to not have that sometimes. Sometimes dynamic programming like this is the right tool in your toolbox. right? Coding by convention is actually useful. So some of the other things that um, kind of held me back, I guess, a little bit from jumping into the Swift boat uh, thing really fast is other frameworks. So Sugar Record is another framework out there that was written in Swift early on. I, I kind of ran across this early. Uh, they, they're... Um, their big thing is that they do multiple uh, file formats. So they do core data, and I think they do Realm. And uh, they have other things that they work on as well. And uh, it's a very similar interface. So I thought, oh, great. You know, these guys kind of, they, they even mentioned, like, hey, they took inspiration from Azure Record and had a lot of their interface to defined the same way. So I'm like, great. You know, maybe they, they solved it for me so I can just focus on the Objective-C stuff. But uh, I think there's still room for Magical Record to have some Swift uh, inside of itself. One of the other things that I was worried, looking for was I saw something called Query Kit. So Query Kit is, uh, if you've ever seen back in the old days, man, I'm really dating myself here. Back in the old days when I worked on, on Microsoft Code, uh, <laughs> one guy in the audience, right? Uh, there was a technology called Link to SQL. All right, so that lets you write wrote SQL code inside of your C Sharp code. And I did write C-sharp code back in the day. And Query Kit reminds me a lot of that. It's basically a, a kind of a SQL domain-specific language written in Swift. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's, it's an interesting project, and it kind of gave me some ideas. Maybe I should kind of venture down that way uh, as far as how to incorporate Swift into a uh, magical record. But uh, if you're curious, definitely you can take a look at that. So, But... The one thing that I wanted to not do was I did not want to rewrite the entire code base. That was kind of my big thing. Like I said, the code base was huge. So I decided not to, and I still am able to get some Swift in there. Uh, again, being pragmatic about things, not throwing away code that works just because I have the new hotness in my hands. Um, the other thing that really made me want to not rewrite the code base was when they announced Swift, when Apple announced Swift back in 2014, they made a big deal about the interoperability, right? S Swift and Objective-C, they're built on the same runtime. There's just different optimizations made for Swift versus Objective-C based on the nature of a, a statically linked language versus dynamically uh, bound language, right? So, but there's still a lot of interoperability, right? You can have Objective-C code and run, you know, have it uh, called from Swift and vice versa. So they can talk to each other. There's no problem with that. That isn't the issue. I don't need to throw away Objective-C code. I can still build more stuff going forward. Um, but there is one problem, and only recently has this been fixed, is if I have an API like this, by default right now, what you would see is you'd see all these crash operators. So the bang. Uh, I, I, I like somebody had given, that, given it that name, the, the crash operator. So this, this uh, explicit, uh, implicitly unwrapped uh, object type uh, kind of indicates that there's a problem with, with your uh, type setting there, right? So you don't know whether it's nil or not. You still have to check if it's nil. So that's a problem. And 
the way to fix that is with this guy right here. So if you have um, some code, uh, you can just really do it on a basically an entire file basis. Just basically say, hey, assume all of the code in between these things is not nil. All the parameters, all the return values, all the stuff is not nil. And it's super awesome. Uh, you can do stuff like this. And the way that I've been able to use it, which is super useful, if I do want something to be nil, I can just say, assume not nil, and then just say, hey, this is the this is the one that you can say, hey, this is nullable. This one, this one, I'll allow this one, right? So this gives me the right way. It basically, what this does is it lets uh, the Swift uh, interpreter in the compiler uh, convert the header information correctly. So now we end up with something without all of the crash operators all over the place. And this helps us integrate with Swift a lot better and a lot more cleanly. And also let Swift help you. So if you do end up giving it uh, an optional parameter, when I really meant not to have an optional, but if I had the crash operators, I could it, Swift couldn't tell. It couldn't help me. So this is trying to let Swift help me help you. Something like that, right? <laughs> so. So ultimately, what I'm going to be doing is using Swift extensions and using those to kind of carry this forward. Now, the benefit of this is that uh, what I can do is uh, maintain the Objective-C code and the Swift code, and I can just have the Swift code almost literally call into the, um, into the Objective-C code. So basically, it's just one more level. And that, that could co cause its own problems later on. But a lot of times, what I really want to focus on is making the API super simple. So we, ha you know, we have category prefixes, prefixes, and we don't need those anymore. Uh, so this is kind of what I was thinking with uh, Magic Record and Swift and integration and going forward. All right, there's a lot of stuff in there. So let's unpack that a little bit. So we have generics, right? So we have a, f a generic find function. And then we have this really weird function signature. All right, so what I've decided to do there is use uh, one of the neat little um, features of Swift called currying. All right, so currying lets me create a partial function, so partially apply a function. So basically, the, the, the mental model that I have in my head is if, if you have a whole lot of if-lets, if you have an if-let and you need to kind of have that pyramid of doom, the currying lets you get rid of that in certain cases. So basically, what I can do is I can have a partial function and say, oh, find me this type, and then just return that function. And what I have after that is a function that will take a predicate order by ascending as parameters. So basically, I have to call this function twice. Now that's kind of weird. Like, why would I do that? No, well, it's handy in like the f a lot of the functional kinds of concepts. But what it also lets me do is, in the bottom case, uh, what we have here is we can say, I'm going to set the context for this function first, and then all the calls after that are going to use that context. So I don't have to worry about the context anymore. All right. So you can kind of specify that, and you know, I've also done that up here. Uh, in the top one, having uh, the context already specified for you. And it's, it's, a, it's a crazy idea, but it lets you do some of the, it lets you use some functional characteristics of Swift. And it, um, it also just, it uses uh, the generics. So, uh, but I think a lot of the, the big important thing is that, uh, two of the important things is we're using the old school Objective-C magical record uh, and then the new syntax actually will read a little bit better going forward as far as how you use it in your Swift code. And using generics, uh, we can do some type checking and type converting and do that all inside of the magical record stuff, whereas uh, you in, in your client code just gets all of the help that the Swift compiler will give you because it's using a generic function versus uh, the any object kind of thing that uh, the the um, Objective C converted Swift headers give you, right? Because if you have um, this find all sorted by method, it returns an array of any object because that's an array of IDs, right? In Objective C, it can't tell you what exactly that type is, but we can kind of force it using the as question mark. Uh, operator, and if we don't succeed, well, we can just say, well, it failed, and just we got no results because we didn't do that right. 
So we can do this without crashing and still have results and still do all that stuff. So that's kind of the way that I was thinking. And if, if we want to use this in our client code, so one scenario that I had thought of was that we could have our stack, and again, we could specify the context in our first call, and now we have a find function. And if we want to limit the scope of our calls to just, in this case, books, we can create a new function from the first find function that says find these books, right? So it finds the books in the context. And then now we can say find books where the title is valid with everything else. So then we can just apply that function as normal. So this is how you would use that API. This has some different characteristics, and it is differently different. Um, but I think being able to separate these steps out is, is a really important way to kind of move forward and move forward with the way to use Magic Record with Swift uh, and to have it feel like it's part of the Swift language versus something that I just ported over from Objective-C. So using uh, some of the same, same ideas, we can just kind of shorten the block syntax and do some really simple save. It's really, uh, it should be really familiar. It's not that complicated. So that's about all for Swift. And uh, yeah, so we have a whole lot of examples actually in this book that I helped co-write, uh, Core Data by Tutorials. Uh, it's all written in Swift. Um, it, uh, it has a lot of stuff with uh, threading, and it's the only book that I know of on Core Data that covers migrations as well. So definitely, uh, if you want to see more Core Data, just raw Core Data with Swift examples, there's definitely a lot there. Um, but anyway, you can also get some more uh, iOS tutorials books. Um, but anyhow, I think that's uh, my time. And uh, be sure to rate the session. Thank you. <laughs> so the question is, what's the story on Core Data and iCloud synchronization? I don't think really much has changed since iOS 8, really. Um, I think it's just gotten more stable. But it's, um, I think it's, it's usable, but I think it's don't think much has changed. Um, we do have a section on that in the book, uh, and it walks you through that. But as far as, I mean, is there more specific, something more specific to that question? So the last that I, that I know of was that Core Data and iCloud is usable. Uh, it's a little easier to set up. Um, and if it does fail, you can recover from it now, and you can reset things. So as far as I know, it's, it's usable. So the question was, didn't they change the uh, Xcode uh, core data entity generator? Um, but uh, Mo Generator has always been my go-to tool. And uh, it Mo Generator also gives you some extra accessors as well. So there are APIs in core data that are very dynamic. So one of the APIs in core data is uh, set primitive value for key. And that's a very generic dynamic function. And it turns out if you just define the function set attribute name for key, like an actual, just the header, you don't have to actually define the function. If you just define the header, core data will create that function for you. And it will um, be more efficient than the generic dynamic function. Right? So, um, and Mo Generator will generate all of those headers for you. So there are definitely some benefits to using Mo Generator that you don't get. You also have uh, an enumeration that Mo Generator will generate for you uh, of all the properties for an entity. So if you have an entity and you have a list of attributes, it has an enumeration with all of the attributes in it, right? So it, it so you can use compiler checked uh, enumerations to see if you've actually reused the same property. Right, so basically you have a tool that will generate a map from compiled code to just raw string values, which Core Data needs in order to look things up. So that's definitely a benefit. So that's, I still use Mo Generator anyway, even if um, even if they've Xcode has been updated to not like have some of the problems they had before. There's still enough benefit with Mo Generator to use it even even now. Uh, so actually, the the question is with with Swift being more of a focus on uh, value types versus reference types uh, being the classical Objective C model. Uh, going forward, do you think you should focus on 
using the, the value types instead of core data. Um, and I actually am doing that um, at, at LoungeBuddy these days. Um, so we're converting over a project to Swift 2, and we're using core data. And what I've actually done is I will store all of the data into core data. So it'll import it, store it in there. And basically, it's got an interface for all of the the data that's available from the kind of the data side of things. And it will actually convert all of the core data objects into structs and value types. The, the difference being is that we actually have a protocol that defines what the data looks like. So basically, uh, in, in, um, in a managed object model defined in protocols. And by having this protocol and having it defined for data, what we can do on the other side of the client is we can vend it whatever implementation we want. We just tell it that it implements the protocol. So all of the, the client depends on is the data protocol. The data that we give it can either be core data, it could be some dictionary that conforms to the protocol somehow, um, it could be um, a struct, right? So it could be any one of those things. But as long as they conform to the protocol, the client code doesn't really care. So what I've done is um, you know, have all of my asynchronous data management, saving things on multiple threads, and do all that crazy concurrency that I have to do with core data kind of in the background, uh, away from kind of the UI client. And before it gets to the UI client, it will actually vend out a copy of the core data object and convert it over to a struct object. So basically just copy all those values into a struct. So now it's a value type and then just give that to the client. So you can, can kind of mix and match. It's whether or not you're willing to accept the trade-off of doing all of that data copying and transformation. So, you know, I think there's still value in both. I mean, I could still have just vended out the straight core data object, have it conform to the protocol, and still be usable. The problem there is that uh, core data uh, really doesn't like it when you cross the threads, cross the streams when it comes to threading. And that also means that even when you're accessing data, you can sometimes crash because you access the object on the wrong thread or the wrong queue. So that could be a problem. So I decided to just do the, the, all the thread management on my own and then just vend out a read-only object that really doesn't care. So that, that hopefully eliminates a lot of those particular problems. Any other questions? I don't think you can do that. So core data is a single process framework. So you really can't share the same instance of core data. Um, you can share maybe the, the persistent store, um, but then you're going to be blocked by the process of the operating system. So the operating system still has to lock the, the SQLite file, right? So when you access things. And the problem with that also is that if you write from one process, you know, how do you update the other one? How does that know? And that's kind of bad too. So that's why you know you really just want to have like one process per per file at a time, um, but yeah, but yeah. The question was, what do you think about uh, um, multiple uh, instances, <laughs> multiple processes accessing the same accessing uh, core data? So yeah, it's a little little complicated there. I try to keep it simple though. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thanks.